Hey fans, Mike Waddell here, president of Your Allen Americans, and this is Building the Brand, episode three. And we have a fantastic show for you today. We're gonna to talk with Kevin Sullivan. He's a former White House communications director. He is also the founder of Kevin Sullivan Communications, but over the course of his career, he's worked in the NBA with the Dallas Mavericks back in the day in the expansion years. He has worked for NBC Sports and the Olympics, NBC News, the Department of Education, and now with his own company, Kevin Sullivan Communications. He works with sports teams, political figures, and business leaders all around the globe. And there is there are very few people who have the absolute talent that Kevin has to be able to go in, put people at ease, and to be able to work with them and make something positive out of a potential major negative. And I have had the uh, personal experience of working with him back early in my career. Um, just was amazed at the work he did and really is a, a pleasure to uh, have him on the show today. Again, Kevin Sullivan coming up in just a little bit here on Building the Brand. Want to share some news with you. We've had more of the ECHL meetings and I think we're very close. I think we're very close to getting a start date for the 2020-21 season. I want to thank Commissioner Ryan Creelan and ECHL Board Chair Brent Thiessen of the Kansas City Mavericks for all the work that they've done along with our COVID committee. Number one thing is when we do get back to playing hockey here at the Allen Event Center, as you see it behind me, this is a full crowd. We're not going to have a full crowd this year. Right now, we're at about 40% of our actual capacity, 2,112 folks. So it's gonna be an intimate environment this year. We're gonna have a lot of fun and we're looking to you to make your suggestions. What do you wanna see? What do you not wanna see? How do you want us to engage? Because this year it's gonna be a little bit hands off. We're not gonna be able to get as close to the players or do some of the things like chuck a puck where we physically take an item and throw it on the ice. So we're gonna to have to come up with some new ideas, new ways of doing things, but just keep in mind that what we do in this COVID year, what we do in the 2020-21 season is only temporary. And then we will get back to normal. And when you come this season to the Allen Event Center, you will be safe. We're gonna go through exhaustive measures. Bill Herman and his staff here with the City of Allen, the Allen Event Center, our staff at the Allen Americans working very hard to come up with protocols to make this the safest environment possible. We will mask up when in the arena. We will have touchless uh, transactions in our team store at food and beverage stations around the uh, concourses. We will make sure that there is hand sanitizer around and we will get back to playing hockey for the first time since March earlier this year. It's been nine months since we have played hockey to the point that we will play hockey again. And that's entirely too long to be away from you, our fans. And for that, we are thankful for all the people who have continued their loyal investment in the Allen Americans, now going into our 12th season with season ticket memberships, full seasons, half seasons, partial plans. Our renewal customers will choose their seats before new customers and we will continue to move forward. I also want to thank uh, the owner of the Allen Americans, Jack Galati, for keeping our front office moving forward, believing in the city of Allen as a hockey community, and keeping this team moving forward in a year where it's going to be a very challenging financial year because we're playing with 60% fewer fans, and fewer fans mean fewer revenues, and that means that you know, what was projected a few months ago is not going to be a reality this year. That's just business. But Jack Galati is committed to Allen. He's committed to the Allen Americans. And we're excited to be committed to you, our fans, and hope that you enjoy all of the content that we're bringing you here these days on AllenAmericans.com. On Wednesdays and Sundays, we have Red, White, and You with Tommy Daniels. Great podcast. On Tuesday, we have Around the ECHL where Maurice, along with uh, Tommy, come in and they get it going. We have a Barry Jansen. We have Brandon Cox. Uh, so many people contributing content to the site now, making this a true hub for Allen Americans fans, and I hope that you enjoy it 
and you enjoy what's coming up after this quick timeout as we are about to go inside the locker room, the boardroom, and the Oval Office with former White House Communications Director Kevin Sullivan, the founder of Kevin Sullivan Communications. That's coming up next right here on AllenAmericans.com. Welcome back in for another edition of Building the Brand with me, Mike Waddell, here on AllenAmericans.com. We're very pleased today to have a true renaissance man, one of the most interesting people, I think, that I've ever had the pleasure to meet and interact with. I'm talking, of course, about Kevin Sullivan. He is the founder of Kevin Sullivan Communications. But if I were to really go through all of the incredibly cool things that Kevin has done over the course of his career, we would make this it'd be almost like Alex Haley's roots. We'd be going back through the, the last 30 uh, years. It would be a mini series uh, going on. But Kevin, you have worked uh, in the locker room, in the boardroom, and in the Oval Office. And that is the subtitle to your book called Breaking Through Communications Lessons from the Locker Room, the Boardroom, and the Oval Office. And I have to ask you straight out of the box, which one was the most fun? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Mike. And it's an honor, not just to be here, but to follow the great Tommy Daniels uh, in your series here. I've known Tommy a long time, going back to his uh, radio days when, when, uh, when I was with the Mavericks. And I was a big KDGE fan. I know Tommy was there for, for a number of years. So he's a great guy. And I, I enjoyed watching that, that uh, edition of your show. Uh, you know, every one of those experiences, I had the, the, the Dallas Mavericks for 18 years, uh, five and a half years at NBC, four and a half of those years at NBC Sports, and then some time on the corporate side with NBC Universal, and then my Washington experience, uh, first at the U.S. Department of Education, then two and a half years as President George W. Bush's White House Communications Director. It's almost embarrassing. You know, I tell people when it comes to once in a lifetime jobs, I've had three of them. Uh, I've been incredibly fortunate, always surrounded by, by really talented teams to, to, to get the work done and to learn and grow and, and all that. Each one of them was different. And maybe today we can talk a little bit about what I, you know, what made each one unique or different or high performance or, or uh, however you want to look at it. And we're going to talk about brand building. Uh, each one was different, but each one uh, helped me uh, you know, professionally and personally in terms of growth and, and just having fun and being surrounded by talented people who most of the time were pulling in the same direction. Well, that's always a, a great way to, to have a workplace be because oftentimes it's not. But let's, let's go back. We'll go back in the way back machine right here, hop in the DeLorean and dial up. You're a student at Purdue and you're thinking, hey, I'm Kevin Sullivan. I'm a Purdue Boilermaker, I'm in the Big Ten, but I have a passion for so many things. How did you decide which avenue to, to focus on when you left West Lafayette? Yeah, it was all in on sports. I mean, I wanted to work in sports my whole life and, and PR was just the way that I could do it. Uh, later, I found that there are people in PR who do it because they love PR, but a lot of times, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Mike, in your career, in sports PR, you see that the people are, many of us, got into it because it was a way for us to work in, in sports. And that was certainly the case. Although I, you know, I always liked to write and I always enjoyed the relationship building and the people part of it. But, uh, you know, I just, I, to be honest, I, uh, I talked my way into an interview. I paid my way to Dallas from Indiana uh, to be interviewed when I was 21 and to be the PR assistant with the expansion Dallas Mavericks. This was the summer before the very first season. Dave Burchett interviewed me. Dave would go on. Uh, to become an acclaimed TV sports TV director, uh, retired last year after many many years with the Rangers and before that a long run with the Mavericks. Uh, and Dave, uh, you know, was looking for an assistant, and uh, I sort of, uh, you know, in fact, the one lesson that I learned then is he asked me, "Can you do the stat crew?" He seemed to be very concerned about how to organize the stat crew, and I had worked with the stat crew at, at Purdue, and I just said, "Yeah, I absolutely I can do that." And and I didn't know everything, but I knew that I could ask people and I could get the forms and I knew how many people you needed and, and those kind of things. And it's a great lesson is when you're interviewing for a job, figure out what the, what the person who's interviewing you uh, is most worried about and tell them you can solve that, that problem. And I really think to this day, that's how I got the job with the Mavericks. And, and, and then, you know, from there, I had, had a great run and, and I met Tom Luce there. 
uh, who was part of the, when Ross Perot Jr. on the team prior to Mark Cuban, Tom was part of that group. And hold that thought for a second, because after my run at NBC, it was Tom that made the connection with me to Margaret Spellings, who had just been sworn in as the Secretary of Education, which, and that's what got me out of NBC Universal you into the Bush that. administration, you never imagining that that would end up at the at the White House. And uh, so, there, you know, once again, you know, relationships are are, are key to my story. Uh, but it was really Tom seeing something in me that thought I could help Margaret. And he, he's the one that gave me the idea that I could do more than just sports. Although I, I already was on the corporate side at NBC Universal. I never tried to, I always tried to avoid being pigeonholed. Uh, and I looked for ways to demonstrate that wherever I worked, um, and, including when I was in sports. But that's kind of how I got to, to, uh, to NBC Universal and then eventually to Washington. Well, the, the job interview stories in your book are amazing even the one with the uh going to the department of education i mean that interview that you had uh give us a little bit of uh, uh insight into that because that 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 might have been the the quickest uh, summation other than when tony snow had you go into the oval office and interview with president bush i mean two great washington interview stories right there yeah, with, with, with Margaret Spellings, I didn't want the job, first of all. I, I, was, I was, you know, really enjoying the NBC Universal experience on the corporate side, learning a lot. And as I mentioned, Tom Luce put us together. I was honored to be contacted by a member of the president's cabinet. I had never been involved in politics. I did not work on the campaign, which is the traditional way you get into uh, the administration. Uh, you know, I was a George W. Bush fan. I voted for him twice, so that wasn't really an issue. But uh, I didn't, uh, I, this was not something I wanted to do. So when she called, uh, my opening salvo to her was, congratulations, Madam Secretary, uh, on being sworn in. I'm honored that you called, uh, but you got the wrong guy. I don't know anything about any of this stuff and government politics, education policy. And, and she said, I don't need a policy expert. I need a communications expert. Will you at least meet me for lunch? And it was at that lunch that before we even ordered, she looked at me across the table and said, I don't know what you'll do after NBC, but this will be the most important thing you've done so far. I'm putting a team together. It's gonna be great. I'm only getting good people. The work is important. Uh, you're gonna love the president. It's gonna be great for your family. And I promise you will always be in the room. I won't make a move without you. And, and I knew, you know, I just thought, wow, you know, uh, this was the job interview. This was the offer. I felt like I was being asked to serve, like I was being called to serve with this opportunity. And at some level, I knew they were only going to ask once because I really was a non-traditional candidate for this job. And so how, what am I going to tell these, these executives at NBC Universal that took a chance on the sports guy and put me in this big job, you know, at, at NBC Universal? And so I agonized a lot of hand wringing. And I'm not normally a hand wringer, but on that one, I, it was a lot of tossing and turning and sleepless nights. My wife was all for it. And ultimately, obviously, I, I decided to take the leap and jump off the cliff, uh, you know, big cut in pay, moving to Washington, temporary job that was going to be over when President Bush was done. And it was really, you know, kind of a leap into the unknown. Uh, and again, I never imagined seriously that it would end up at the White House. And then 13 months later, uh, that's exactly where it, it ended up. And, and just to, to tie it up, your, your, your reference to the interview in the Oval Office, you know, how do you prepare for a a job interview with the President of the United States. And, and Dan Bartlett, the counselor to the President, had, had told me that the interview would be personal in nature. Uh, it, you know, kind of a chemistry check almost with the President. I didn't know him at, at all. I had met him in a photo line, that was it. And, um, and I knew my sports background would be of service, of, 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 of interest as a connector. But I didn't want to come across like some guy that was in a bunch of fantasy leagues and had nothing else to offer. So I really gave this a lot of thought, like how can I use my sports background to make a connection with President Bush? And of course I thought of baseball. And uh, when I went in for the interview, you know, I walked in, I felt like I was walking onto a movie set. You know, it was bright, you know, your Oval Office. And I said, sir, it's an honor to be here. And he said, yeah, it is. It's an honor for me too. Take a look around, the Oval Office, isn't this cool? And he immediately put me at ease. Uh, and I, as I sat down on the couch, I, I noticed that there was a briefing paper on the, on the end table with my name at the top of it, which was a little intimidating. And, and um, he looked, he kind of glanced at the paper and he said to me, I know that you're 
with Margaret at Education. I know you worked at NBC. I know you worked for the Mavericks, but where are you from? And, and I said, Chicago, sir, White Sox, not Cubs. And I had thought this through, like that could be a way. I knew he was an American League guy. Jerry Reinsdorf, the White Sox owner, was very instrumental in bringing him into baseball as the managing general partner of the Rangers, our owner. Uh, and he loved it, you know, and he kind of laughed and he looked at Dan Bartlett and said, you know, we got a baseball fan here. And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. President, and except for the birth of my kids and all that kind of stuff, until until this moment, the highlight of my life was being at game two of the of the 05 World Series when Scott Pitsednik hit the walk-off homer. And, and that was the connector. And it's one of the greatest things about working in sports is it really does bring people together and it does unite and, and you have common ground and you can find a way to to uh, have some empathy, show some shared interest. And and that was a great connector for us. And then the interview kind of went, went from there. But uh, you know, that's, that was a great example of sports, you know, bringing people together and it worked, for, it worked for me. Absolutely. We're talking with Kevin Sullivan. He's the founder of Kevin Sullivan Communications. I'm Mike Waddell, president of the Allen Americans, and you're tuned in to building the brand right here on allenamericans.com. So I want to go to the aftermath of that interview in the Oval Office and something that Tony Snow uh, told you, you have no idea. You have yeah. no idea what you don't know. And I think that is a neat transition into personal branding, Kevin, because everybody in the day and age of social media, everybody in this new media world feels like they are the Dan Rather, the Roger Mudd, my favorite Frank Reynolds, uh, you know, in the aftermath of Reagan being shot, get the damn facts right. Uh, right. They had said that one of your uh, predecessors, James Brady, had died when he had not. But, but everybody is an expert now, but are they? Because I think every day, even true professionals, I would fancy myself as being somebody who knows something about communications and what to do and what not to do. And in reading your book, I was going, man, I could do so much better. I mean, how many of your clients truly have no idea what they're doing up until the point that you and, and, and your team there at Kevin Sullivan Communications get in and work with them. They, they have an idea, but they, they need, sometimes they need the outside perspective. They need to be a step back where you're not in the middle, you know, in the, in the thick of things. Uh, and that's where we come in with a little strategy message and helping manage issues. The point about, you know, declaring yourself a thought leader on your social media bio, I'm a thought leader on this or that, uh, it's, you know, the most effective way to do it is that over time you demonstrate rather than just assert that you're a thought leader. And in terms of, you know, building a personal brand, which we all are empowered to do now because of what happens online and with social media and digital media, like what we're doing here, Mike. And the, the first thing is to ask yourself, who's my audience? You know, just like when I got to NBC Sports, I was aware I'm part of this bigger enterprise here now. There's an entertainment division. There's a news division. I want everybody here to see me as a communications person, not as a sports communication person only. And 9-11 and, and provided an opportunity to do that a little bit because we all got deputized to, to help out at NBC News for, for a few days after that happened. The Olympics gave me a chance to do that because I worked a lot with the corporate side and the sales side because that, the, the, the Olympics at NBC in, in, in envelops the entire company, the other cable networks that we had uh, and so I was aware I wanted my audience to be bigger than the, a narrow, you know, sports audience. So, you know, who's my audience is, is number one. You've got to do it authentically. If it's not authentic, if you're trying to be somebody else, you know, you see people at Silicon Valley startups dressing like Steve Jobs. You don't want to be derivative or copycat. You, know, you want it to be authentic for you. And it comes down to what are your values? What are you passionate about? What are your key traits? What are you good at? And over time, you try to, you, you sort of uh, present yourself in a way that gives people a feel for what you're about. And, you know, to me, you know, you want to you wanna stand for something, you want to be known for something. So ask yourself, what do I want to be known for? And, and you sort of approach it that way over time, learning along the way from the missteps that you might, might have. It does take time. It happens online. All of us can do it. But that's, that's kind of my, my thoughts on how to approach it. What's the most absurd situation you've ever been in? 
<laughs> well, you know, there's- Very open-ended. I, I, you can go personal, you can go that. Well, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you one that yeah. comes to mind is uh, when I got uh, hired to be the uh, assistant secretary of education, which is just kind of hard for me to even say out loud that I was, that I would ever have that job. But, you know, I was the assistant secretary for communications and outreach and, 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 and my job, you know, there were about 130 people under my watch, which is one of the reasons that I took the, took that position. It was going to be a different kind of leadership and management challenge, 10 regional offices, but principally I was in charge of message and strategy and managing issues, which I had done a lot in my career. I had a really good team, uh, a great press secretary named Susan Aspie and, uh, and, and, a, and a communications director named Tracy Young, both people I'm still in touch with. But, but what, ha what happened was I, I got announced as the, as the assistant secretary for communications and outreach and a member of one of the teachers unions fired off. They don't need another communications person. They need more funding for No Child Left Behind and they need more of this and they need, it's like I hadn't even met the person. They didn't really know much about me other than I came from NBC and they were against me you know, right from the beginning. And that was a great Washington lesson to learn before I had even gotten to town. And so that sort of thing is, 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 is to me was kind of absurd is hear me out. Like, let me, let's talk. And, and this guy didn't, without any, in, without any evidence, he went right for the political cheap shot. And I would put, I'd, I'd say that was one of the more absurd things that I, that I faced as a, as a communicator. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging world out there. And especially in the era of COVID where we are right now. Um, you know, you look at, uh, we're going to mix a little uh, business and sports right now because sports has come back. It was on the shelf for a while. It was actually painful trying to watch guys get through sports center episodes because they're writing their own copy as we both know, and right. they're, they're going nuts. So what am I going to write about tonight? Well, now they have like sports overload, but the numbers are way down. Do you see those uh, coming back? Is that just a sign of the times? I mean, wh wh where do you see the, uh, the, the sports and especially the media industry uh, connecting moving forward? Yeah, I think sports will, the sports industry will continue to grow. What we're seeing, more people are watching sports, but we've never had a moment in time like this before where the, you know, the, the Stanley Cup final is being played at the same time as the NFL. And, and every college football and, and baseball playoffs and every, you know, there's just, it was all at one time. And I think, you know, the NFL is down, which is, which is surprising uh, because of the pent up demand and, and everything. But, but I think more people are watching it. The pie is just divided up in, a, in, in, in more pieces. And, and I think once we sort of settle back into our normal rhythms, uh, things will, will level out and continue to get back on, on the upswing. We're talking with Kevin Sullivan here on Building the Brand. Kevin is the founder of Kevin Sullivan Communications, and he's had some great experiences in his life. Now, one of the uh, cool things that I read in your book and the name of that book, and tell us uh, where we can get it, though. It's called Breaking Through Communications Lessons from the Locker Room, the Boardroom, and the Oval Office. But you're on this helicopter one time, and it's, it's, it's you, yeah. the Terminator, and W. I mean, is this one of those times in your life where you're looking around and saying, what the hell is Kevin Sullivan from Chicago doing on the plane with the president and the Terminator? Yeah, when I, before I got to the White House, Margaret Spellings told me, you're going to have four or five pinch me moments every week. <laughs> and that was a big one. Uh, and what happened there, we were, we had gone on a, a California wildfire uh trip, you know, for the president to meet with uh, officials out there, including Governor Schwarzenegger at the time and, and the, the Forestry Service firefighters. And, and following that, that, uh, that, that visit to the site where the fires had burned through a neighborhood, we, we took Marine One, the president's helicopter, to another event. And I was sitting there and I looked up and, you know, President Bush was, was to, to my left as I looked forward and Governor Schwarzenegger to the right, and I just sat there and I thought, "How did this happen?" And and really, it, honestly, I think it was the it, it was a combination of the hand of God, being in the right place at the right time, working hard, w whatever. But but uh, it, it's just kind of stunning that I ended up there. And anybody who knew me, high school, college, the Mavericks, believe me, they didn't say this guy is destined for the West Wing. 
you know, and I really, I, I, it was just one of those things where, you know, Tom Luce, who I, I mentioned I met through the parole ownership group, you know, he, he connected with, with Margaret and you kind of go from there. And, and I've always had those sort of relationship connectors. Brian McIntyre, the longtime NBA uh, head of communications, he, he, at NBC Sports, they had interviewed, uh, I think, five or six people for that job uh, who had turned him down, or a number had turned him down anyway. And McIntyre said, you ought to talk to Sully. And that's, then that's kind of how I got in the mix. I knew the job was open, but I didn't go for it. I was, I, I, you know, I was in Dallas. I'd been with the Mavericks a long time. We had just bought a house. We spent all the money we had to renovate this house in Lake Highlands. And the timing was, was all wrong. And that's why I, I held back. And there may have been on some level, you know, New York, 30 Rock, Ruthless Network TV, I don't know. Uh, hard on the family, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I used the excuse that the timing was all wrong. Uh, but really, we, we moved into that house and 11 weeks later, the, there was a for sale sign in the yard. And again, with no money for a down payment, it was a very stressful time, but it was a jump off the cliff. And that jump off the cliff made the one to Washington easier. Once you do it once and, and you don't kill yourself on, the, on impact, it's, it's easier to do. And, and again, my wife was in my corner and, and thought this could be a great thing for me professionally and for our family is a great adventure. And you, know, you wanna surround yourself with people who are only gonna have your best interests. When you have those big kind of life moment inflection points, don't crowdsource them. You know, don't talk to too many people, get too many opinions is what I learned on, uh, on, on that one. And of course it, it worked out uh, really well, obviously. And, and it just, is, I'm humbled by the whole, the whole thing. I, I really mean that I've just been, been fortunate to have these opportunities. Well, you mentioned jump off the cliff and that's a brilliant uh, segue over to one of my favorite episodes of the TV show and NBC Universal product, The West Wing, when President uh, Josiah Bartlett, Jed Bartlett of New Hampshire, looks over to his uh, then White House uh, press secretary, CJ Craig, and says, are you ready to jump off a cliff? Right after uh, Chief of Staff Leo McGarry, uh, you know, has his heart attack and he's no longer going to be able to serve in that, uh, that thing. Right. I, I love the West Wing. It's all that. But when you watch that show, you, you can differentiate between reality and Hollywood. Which West Wing character are you? And you can't say C.J. Craig. Now, I was sort of a combination of, of uh, Toby Ziegler and Sam Seaborn. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, not as good looking as, as Rob Lowe, but, uh, you know, because we had, the President Bush had, had a counselor to the president, first Dan Bartlett and then, and then uh, Ed Gillespie. It was Karen Hughes at the beginning of the administration. And that person was over the, the communications director, the press secretary, and the head of speech writing. And then I had, I had three deputies in the communications office and you kind of go from there. And then the West Wing, they didn't have that counselor to the president role. So it's a little different, but I love the show. I, I've watched, I think every episode uh, at least twice. I, this part of my binging and during the pandemic was I, I rewatched the first three episodes. Uh, I loved it way before I ever worked there. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of similarities. In fact, uh, when, uh, when I, my counterpart, uh, or my my uh, colleague, press secretary, you mentioned Tony Snow, and then after him, it was Dana Perino, after Tony got sick and sadly passed away. Uh, and there was a time when uh, CJ, there was an episode of The West Wing where uh, CJ Craig was being accused of muzzling the scientists. The, the, the Bartlett administration was being accused of muzzling scientists at the EPA. And when Dana Perino was press secretary, that actually happened to us. And I went to her and I said, we got to watch the, the West Wing episode and look and see how CJ handled this. And uh, uh, I don't think that we actually did that, but it was, it was a, a light moment that day when we talked about the West Wing. And a lot of similarities, you know, the pace is very similar. The notion that anything can happen in a day is very realistic. The physical setup of the TV show is not very accurate. They've combined a number of things from the, from the White House residence with the West Wing into kind of one place for, for TV reasons. Uh, and, and, but it's, it's a great show, the writing is incredible. And there's a lot of things that are very, very accurate about it. 
talking with Kevin Sullivan, founder of Kevin Sullivan Communications. We're coming down to the end here, but I want to go back to something, Kevin, that you talked about earlier, because I think it might be one of the more important takeaways for the folks are watching this today. And it goes back again to building your personal brand and being authentic. You've talked about that a number of times. And, you know, George W. Bush, he's nothing if not authentic. I mean, right. the guy, you know, you know, went with his gut on a lot of things and just seems like he's the type of guy that you want to hang out with. A lot of people would say the same thing about Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter, just regular guys, you know, uh, just, just good people. But early in your career with the Mavericks, we're going to go back to sports. We're going to go back again to the old, uh, the, the green and blue Mavericks days with Brad Davis and my guy, Sam Perkins. Right. From Latham, New York over there. I'm number 41 for the Tar Heels there, uh, my team. But, but th there was a time when there was another uh, very heralded uh, rookie, and his name, well, Jason Kidd, uh, one of the, the greatest of all time. And he came to you and said, I want to be the NBA Rookie of the Year. I want to be better than that guy that, that is from Duke. I mean, Duke, bad, Carolina, good. <laughs> but, 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 but you gave him some really good – very strong advice that we try to live here at the Allen Americans. We want to be very accessible. We really want to be out there. And, you know, Tommy Daniels, as you mentioned, he does a lot of podcasts, but we're very accessible to our fans because we work for the fans without the fans. We have no job. And, and you know, that's very important. But share that story about Jason Cave, the advice you gave him that led to him uh, sharing the honor with uh, Grant Hill. Yeah, he, he, he came to Tony Faye, who was my assistant, uh, and me, and, and said, what do I have to do to win the Rookie of the Year award? And Grant Hill was off to a huge uh, lead early on. He got right out of the gate. The Mavericks weren't winning as much. And, and so we said, it's really simple. Be accessible to the media who has the votes. And, and, and so, and, you know, the, it's not obvious which media, beat media, have votes for which categories in the NBA in the NBA awards because there's they divide them up and not everybody gets every gets a ballot for every award so I just started to do my homework to, and I would ask the other PR guys who's got your rookie of the year vote sometimes directly sometimes a little a little more subtly and I found out basically who a, a, who a bunch of the voters were when they came through Dallas we just made sure that we introduced Jason to him. And then we did a bunch of other things. There were videos that Dave, Dave Burchett was, was uh, involved in and others that wor worked there and, and uh, created a campaign for him. Of course, all those triple doubles in his play on the court were the main thing, but he was just likable. And that's another thing. You know, he, I mentioned empathy as a way to connect, likability, humility, gratitude, all those things are great connectors. And, and Jason had all of that. He had a cool name. He wore a cool number, number five. He played fast. He was new. You know, our brains can't resist stuff that's new. And he burst onto the scene in such a way. Uh, but he had, a, he had a plan. And he, act, he asked us for a plan. He was all in. And, and we were able to execute the plan. And the funny thing about that, when, when he, and he loved the fact that he shared the award with Grant Hill. They had been friends going back a number of years. And they decided we're going to have a blast on the media tour. So we went to New York. The Pistons uh, PR director had a, had a conflict. So I sort of went to handle both Grant Hill and Jason Kidd. And I said to Grant, you know, I've been bad mouthing you for the last six months. And he <laughs> said, well, what did you say about me? And I said, the only thing I could come up with is that you have an overdue library book at Duke, you know, because he was such, you know, and both of them in the Hall of Fame, you know, it's a great, ended up being a great, a great story of, 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 of uh, you know, two, two friends pulling for each other and sharing the award. It was a cool, cool thing to be a part of. But you know what, in life, just have a plan, man. You know, I mean, think about where you want to be and, and, uh, and, and lay out a plan to get there. And that's, that's, that's a good lesson to be learned for all of us from what Jason uh, came up with. And Grant Hill having a neat tie back here to Dallas with his uh, father, Calvin Hill. And actually right. the most impressive Hill might be his mom. I had That's a chance right. to meet her one time uh, when I was working at the Tar Heel Sports Network way back in the day. And I said, wow. Uh, Dean Smith, I remember uh, we were uh, taping an edition of his uh, TV show, and it was right before we were playing Duke, and he was talking about Grant Hill. But he said, I really wish I could have had him because he had the best parents 
of anybody that I've ever lost to Duke. Now, which was insulting to Bob Ferry, uh, but that's a, <laughs> that's a whole other NBA uh, story that we can get onto uh, later on. But Kevin, thank you so much. If you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing here in uh, Dallas now when your travels bring you back here and the work that you do with the uh, George W. Bush Presidential Center over at SMU. Yeah, you know, we, we live part-time in Dallas. I've been back part-time for uh, five years now. Uh, so, so we love being back. And uh, I, I, I serve as a, a senior advisor at the, at the George W. Bush Presidential Center, which is a blast to get to stay c connected with, with him and also the work that we, that we all did. Uh, people don't always realize there's a policy institute attached to the, to the Bush Center. So it's not just the museum and the library. And a lot of good work, a lot of people get helped by the work there, whether it's transitioning veterans, uh, you know, we're gonna look for immigration reform to be on the on front and center in 2021 when President Bush's new book comes out about, uh, uh, called uh, Out of Many One, which is portraits of immigrants that he's painted and stories he's gonna tell. So love doing that. And at uh, Kevin Sullivan Communications, you know, we do a lot of work in sports and entertainment and corporate nonprofit. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at KSully with an IE on the end and, uh, and all the other usual places. Uh, but really, thanks for having me on, Mike. This has been a blast. And, uh, and go Americans. I hope you get back uh, sooner than later and, and, uh, and get back in the postseason. R rumor has it we're going to be back uh, sometime in December and that the playoffs could actually extend all the way until July. So how prophetic we get our fifth championship in 12 years on July 4th, and maybe we can have Kevin Sullivan and George W. Bush out there <laughs> co-dropping the first uh, puck uh, right at, here at the Allen Event Center. But Kevin, you, you're, you you're an absolute uh, you know, class act, and I appreciate it so much. We'll talk to you down the road, hopefully right here at the AEC. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. Hey, you're, you're great. I, I really do. I, I, I'm not going to be pretentious and tell you something I don't. I don't read a lot of books. Uh, I, I've read enough when I was in school, and I listened to a lot of audio books. Right. Uh, but, but I really enjoyed yours, and I'm going to go through it again, and uh, I'm going to shoot it over to my son, who's working down at Clemson now. But, uh, oh, good. Get, yeah, get that's great. Let, let's get that beer when you come back to town. Yeah, we will do. And, and uh, I really appreciate you having me on, Mike. It's great to see you even on Zoom, and let's, uh, let's get together when it's, when it's safe to do so. Absolutely, sir. Take I'm care sorry. now. Take care. I'll tell Ben you said hi. Thank you now. <laughs> One of the great partners that we have here with the Allen Americans is called Paint Ovations. The owner of Paint Ovations is Ron Bledsoe, and he and his crew have come in. They painted our locker room, they painted our offices, and they made them look fantastic. The attention to detail, the craftsmanship that goes into a quality paint job for your home, your office, wherever, the details matter, and the folks at Paint Ovations do a fantastic job. They are in, they get the job done quickly, they clean up after the job is done, and the result is that you look like a million bucks. Your space looks fantastic, and that's all because Ron Bledsoe and his crew at Paint Ovations truly care about making you proud to have selected them. If you want to get to know more about Paint Ovations, Google them, Paint Ovations. They're right here in North Texas. You can also call them at 972-741-4995. Again, that number, 972-741-4995. It's Paint Ovations, the official painter of the Allen Americans. Well, that was a great show. Kevin Sullivan of Kevin Sullivan Communications with us right here on AllenAmericans.com. What a career. The Dallas Mavericks, NBC Sports, the Olympics, the Department of Education, the Oval Office, and now in his private communications consulting practice, Kevin Sullivan. He's not from Texas, as he told you. He's from Chicago. White Sox, not Cubs. Went to school at Purdue. Went to school at Iona. But he chooses to live right here in Texas, and he is just a magnificent member of our community. We're looking forward to having him and hopefully President George W. Bush come out to an Americans game this coming season. For all of us here at AllenAmericans.com, that'll do it for this episode of Building the Brand. Until next week, I'm Mike Waddell, Live in the Red.